Good morning. Bring you greetings from Hicksville, Ohio. I trust one of your ministers is there sharing in my place there at our church. <clears throat> Enjoy the the uh, the exchange that we can have as churches of like precious faith. Enjoy that, being able to, I would enjoy it more if I could be there and listen to Tim preach, but we um, enjoy that exchange that we can share. I'd like to turn to Psalm 11. Psalm 11. The title of the message this morning is, If the Foundations Be Destroyed. And I believe the verse that we're going to be looking at is familiar to all of us. Later here in the message, I want, want your input in identifying what some of these foundations, these stones in our foundation, what some of those are. And I'd, I'd like to have your your input, your interaction on that. <clears throat> Psalm 11. Let's just read, let's read the whole psalm there, but we're mainly going to be looking at verse 3. It says, In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privately shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try, the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, in an horrible tempest, this shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, and his countenance doth behold the upright. As I, as I look at verse 3, the writer almost seems like he's wringing his hands that if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? He's almost like he's just wringing his hands about the situation. And as, I, as I've thinking about some of the society and some of the things that are happening in society around us. You know, sometimes we look at that and we wonder, what can we do? And I'm, I'm blessed as I look at the next, very next verse. He says, the Lord is in his temple. And he looks. He's trying. He's watching. He sees what's happening. And it is true that as we look at what's happening in the world around us, and we look at all that's taking place in society, it is true that society's foundations are crumbling. The tenets that this country was, as a general rule, was built on, those tenets are being abandoned and they're being left behind. And there's a new, there's a different set of, of foundation that's being tried to bring in, be brought in, to build on, and it's not going to work. It's going to fail. <clears throat> it sounds like a hopeless situation. And yet he says there, God is still trying these. He still loves righteousness. He still hates wickedness. Now that's not really where I want to go with this message. But I, I, I just love this thinking of that. Is that God, even though we sometimes wonder what can we do. God is still in control. God still loves righteousness. And he hates wickedness. By implication, this verse shows the importance of a foundation. So he says there, he says, if the foundations be destroyed, so by implication he's saying, that, and he's showing that the, the foundation is very important. Some of you are in the building trade. And you understand that in order for the, the structural integrity of a building to be structurally sound, the foundation is where it starts. Now, there can be other aspects of the building that are structurally unsound as well. But you can have the soundest building. You can have it built to, this, to specs. But if the foundation isn't there, it won't stand. It won't hold up. 
It won't be stable. <clears throat> we were in Jerusalem. What's that been now? Two and a half years ago? I think it was two and a half years ago. March of, of 19. Is that right, Bethany? March of 19. We were in, in Jerusalem. And I'm amazed at, at their building practices. It's different than it is here in America. They're, they're the, the way they lay, build their foundations, and most of it's more of an ancient architecture, but the size of the stones that they use to build with, to me, it's, it's, it's incredible. How do, you, how do you move a rock that size? In the Western Wall, there's one rock that's 11 feet tall, 44 and a half feet long. I'm not sure how long is this building. How long is the sanctuary? It's probably getting pretty close to that 45, 50 foot mark from the sanctuary to, the, to that corner. And so it's 44 and a half feet long, 11 feet tall, and estimated to be about five feet deep. What would a stone like that weigh? Anyone want to guess? They estimate it to be around 300 tons, 600,000 pounds. Now, how do you get something that size into place? I haven't seen a crane big enough yet to move something like that in our modern, quote, advanced civilization. Well, that one's 300 tons, but, this, but from what I've been told, the largest rock known to have been carved, been cut out, and moved is in Lebanon. And that one weighs... 880 tons, and there's three of them. And it's not the lowest part of the foundation. It's actually about five feet up to the bottom of that rock. And we look at that and we wonder, how in the world do you put something like that in place? But I think, you know, as we look at those foundations, those things have been there for thousands of years. And the way we build today probably won't be there for thousands of years. You know, when we get ready for a foundation, we just bring the concrete truck in and we pour a foundation. We pour it. I dare, dare say that they, the way they build a foundation took more skill than the way we do it today. But, you know, as we, as we look at the foundation, it's what the building rests upon. It's what's important. It's one of the most important aspects of the building. To have that foundation done right is one of the most important aspects of the building. A good foundation is no better than the soil upon which it rests. There's buildings that we, that I've been made aware of that have sunk because of the, the dirt that was under it was not stable. Jesus tells a parable of how one man built his house on a foundation while the other man built his without a foundation and just on sand. Which one stood? Which one stood the tests of time, the elements? It was the one with, that was built with a foundation. It was the one that was done right. That was the one that was able to withstand the onslaught of the elements, the storms that came in life. <clears throat> if we try to build on something other than the foundation which God has provided us, we will not be able to withstand the tests of time. You know, Psalms 127, there's another familiar verse that we know. It says that if the, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. You know, as we build in life, as we go through life, unless God's involved in this thing, it's not going to stand. It's not going to hold up. I'm also reminded, you know, go back into Genesis 11, where after the flood, they went to build this tower. And they left God out of the picture, I believe. And God took a look at what was happening, what they were trying to accomplish. They were trying to accomplish something without God. And God brought that thing to confusion. He brought that thing to nothing. 
They were trying to do something without God being in it. And so I believe that when we look at the foundation of our life, and as we build on that, unless God is in it, it won't stand. It, will, it won't hold up. Isaiah 28, verse 16 says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now that sounds like some of the Paul's writings in the New Testament, but that's an Old Testament writing. He says, I lay in Zion a stone, a tried stone, one that's been proven, and it stands. It holds up. It is a sure foundation. In Matthew 21, 42, Jesus saith unto them, in verse 44 as well, Did ye never read the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and is marvelous, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So Jesus is asking, he says, Haven't you read in the scriptures? I'm not sure if I was aware of where this was found until I did some study on this, in this for this message. But Jesus is quoting from Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. Almost, almost identical, word for word. Verse 44 says, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And I think you know, he's referring to how that if we come to him in repentance, in brokenness, that we can build on that. But if we fail to do that, at the end of life, that same stone will grind to powder those who have not been broken by it. So as he, as he, as he, brought, as he talks about this stone, he says, have you never read? Who is he, who or what is he referring to? In Acts 11, almost the same verse again, it says, This is the stone. And we should maybe back up to verse 10 of that. So we think of that Jesus asked a question. He says, Have you never read that the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner? Now in Acts 4, I think he's kind of answering that question of who that is. Verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if this day we be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. And he goes down and he says, And this is the stone that was set of naught by you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there any salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. <clears throat> so I think that there in Acts, he answers that question. Who is this stone? Who is this head of the corner? that Jesus was asking the Pharisees, haven't you read? He says very, very clearly, very directly, who that stone is. It was Jesus. And it was the work of the cross, I believe. There is, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. 1 Corinthians 3 9 to 15. First Corinthians 3, 9 to 15. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. I find it interesting. He said you are God's husbandry. You are his building. You, he's, he's using this analogy of a building. 
According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereupon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. I find it interesting that he says, take heed how you build upon this foundation. But the main point there is that he says that there is no other foundation but Jesus Christ, which is laid. <clears throat> I think we would all agree that Jesus is the cornerstone in this foundation. And as, a, as, as I think of a cornerstone, it's the reference point by which we pull all other, by which all other dimensions are pulled and directed. Oftentimes on the commercial projects, you have someone come out and lay the buildings out. And they give a reference point. They give a benchmark. And everything that you pull from there on comes from that benchmark. Heights, um, dimensions to the corner, they all come from that, that reference point. And as a cornerstone, Christ is there. And it's from that reference point that we go. Be from that point on out. If we use a different reference point than what God has established, will we end up where we want to be? No. If we use a different reference point, reference point than what God has established, which is Jesus Christ, and as we, as we continue down that foundation, will we end up right? No, we will not end up right. The rest of the foundation pivots upon the placement of the cornerstone in our lives. If Jesus needs to be first, Jesus needs to be that cornerstone, and the rest of the foundation pivots off of that cornerstone. So as we think of a foundation, I think it's fair to say that a foundation is made up of multiple stones especially if you think of, of ancient architecture. A foundation was made up of multiple stones. Jesus is the cornerstone. But what else builds that foundation for us? I'd like to look at a few more scriptures. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 8. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 8. This is still referring somewhat to, to Jesus. Verse 4, he says, To whom coming as a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Christ Jesus. Wherefore also it is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion, and he's referring back to that Scripture in Isaiah. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they also were appointed. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22.
Now this scripture here brings in some 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 of those other starts bringing in some of those other stones that I'm referring to, and I'd like for your I'd like to have your help with identifying some of these other stones. Verse 19 of Ephesians 2 says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So he says this foundation is also comprised of the apostles and the prophets. Verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. <clears throat> just like to refer back to the, the verse in Isaiah just real briefly here. The latter part of that verse says, He that believeth shall not make haste. It's been interesting to look what another translation would translate that word haste there. But it says, He that believeth. And I think, you know, it's clear that it's those that believe that are building upon that foundation. One more thing before we go into identifying some of these foundation stones. Luke 6. So we have already looked here. It says that the foundation is built upon the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. I'd like to look at Luke 6, verses 46 to 49. It's a familiar passage, passage to us as well. We sing the song that's based on this passage here. But in Luke 6, verse 46, he starts out, he says, And why call you me, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the sayings, do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. And then he goes on and he talks about this, these two men that built this, their houses. One built upon a foundation. He made sure that he was building upon a foundation. And he says it stood the, it's withstood the, the uh, elements, the onslaught of the elements. It withstood those. The floods came, the rains came, and it held. It stood. The other man didn't build upon a foundation, built upon the sand, just laid his building out on top of the ground. And he said it that when the storms came, the floods came, it was destroyed. It didn't stand. It fell. But what I want to look at just at the, at the beginning of that portion, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? Is I will liken whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you what he is like. So I think we have now another part of the foundation, what makes it up, and that is the sayings of Jesus. So we have the writings of the apostles and what they teach us. We have the sayings of Jesus and what he taught while he was here. But those all are hinged upon Jesus being the chief cornerstone. So we know that that, chief, that cornerstone is Jesus and everything else is going from there. Now I, I would like for you, I should have had somebody draw me a, a foundation Stable enough up here or not? No. 
<laughs> it might come crashing down. So if we, I'm not sure if I can draw this in a perspective or not. Well, is one of them better than another one? go around the corner. Anyhow, okay. as we think of the foundation, and the importance of a good foundation, we would say that the first, here in the corner, that is Jesus Christ. Christ and the work that he's done on the cross. That's, that's, the, that's the cornerstone. That's what everything else in the Gospels hinges upon. Everything in our lives needs to hinge upon Jesus Christ. He is first and foremost in our lives. But what are some other things, what are some other doctrines and some things that God has provided as a foundation for us to build on? And we could, I'm just going to make I'd like to list some of those on the side here. I don't think I have room to, to write all that in here. But What are some things you think of? God's word. God's word. What about God's word? Salvation. But I mean, just, I'm thinking of, the, I guess I have down here, the veracity of scripture or the, the scripture's truth. There, that's being questioned. That scripture is really what, it's just a story to teach us things. Is it? No. no. And so, well, Jesus said in John, he says, thy word is truth. And I'm thinking also of the verse in Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, that all scripture is given by inspiration. It is God's word. the veracity of scripture that God's the scripture is what it is it is God's word to us and he, and he means what he says in it what's another part of that when I think of the truth of scripture of scripture being true what's being promoted as another another option for how we came here Evolution. So is, 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 do we believe in a six-day creation or do we believe in a long creation? And there's many churches that are accepting what's called the long creation theology. In other words, yes, God was the one that started all this, but it did, it did take millions of years for that to happen. Is that, do we, is that something that we should be pretty strong on? I feel like it is. I feel like the six-day creation, the belief, or the, the, the doctrine of the creation is pretty important as a foundational principle in our lives. If I can't believe that God says what he says in Genesis 1 there, that this is the way it happened, 
Why would I believe the rest of Scripture? Exodus is pretty clear. It says, in six days created he them. The heavens and everything that it is. I think it's Exodus is it 20. He's speaking of the Sabbath day. He says, for the seventh day that God rested, it says, for in six days he created everything. I think that's pretty important. Six-day creation. Let's think about the sayings of Jesus. What are, some th- what are some things that Jesus taught that are foundational principles in the Christian's life? Love. Love for who? Thy neighbor. Thy neighbor? Just a neighbor? For God. For God? All your heart. Who else? Enemies. Now we can understand loving our friends, but that was a that was a that was a principle that Jesus set that was I would say um, revolutionary. You didn't love your enemies. So love. I mean, we could put down for God for you name it. I'm just put down love for that for now. What are some more? Non-resistance. Non-resistance. Very. And more than just not doing anything, but also he said, pray for enemies, do good. He he pulls a fire upon their head. Um, Feed them. Are those, as we think of what, what we base, maybe I should clear this up a little bit. When I think of the foundation in your life, this is what you believe. These are doctrines. These are things that you believe upon which you make your decisions through life. It's a foundation for as you go through life and you build upon that foundation. You make your decisions based on these things that you believe. They're a basis for your life. What are some more? Okay. It's meant to be practical. It's meant to be lived out, isn't it? Especially um, the Sermon on the Mount. Most Protestant theology would not believe that that is applicable for today. I'm not sure how to write that in there. So it's meant to be lived. What about where Jesus talks about purity? And he says that um, in, in times past it was said that if, if a man commits adultery, but he says, I tell you that if you look on a woman and lust after you've already committed adultery in her heart, it's, it's a principle that he laid. It's a foundation. Purity. What about finances? What, what, did, what were some of Jesus' teachings on finances? He says we're not supposed to lay up. We're supposed to lay up treasure where? In heaven. In heaven. We're not really supposed to lay them up here. He says, but lay them up in heaven. He gives some pretty, pretty uh, clear instruction on some of those things. What truth is? Is truth? Is truth um, relative? Or is truth truth? It's a lot of what's being taught today is truth is relative. But truth is based on who Jesus is, and truth is 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 manifested in a person as God. Talks about trusting God. There's some of the sayings of Jesus. Self sacrificial love. He says that talks about you know how that we need to give our lives for each other. And he demonstrated it by his own actions. <laughs> Humility. I think that's a very important 
foundation that Jesus gave is humility, meekness. I'd like to switch a little bit now to doctrines. What about some of the doctrines that we read, especially in thinking of what the apostles wrote in the epistles? What are some doctrines that are very foundational? Cross bearing. Let me try one of these others. Oh, yeah. Cross bearing. You know, it's very, very clear that we need to, the old man needs to be mortified, and the new man be brought in. What about separation nonconformity? Is that important? I think it is. Separation nonconformity. What are some others that, that we're taught? Sanctity of marriage. Is that under attack? Very much. Yes, it is. Very much so. Sometimes closer home than we like to see it. What does the Bible teach about res authority? Respect for authority. I think that's important. What about the headship order and the veiling? Is that an important doctrine to us? Is that a foundational principle that we build on? I think it is. The headship order. Another one I think of is love and respect for others, regardless of race and status. You know, James, he talks about, he warns against being partial to those who are rich to, versus a poor person. Relationships, whether marital, parental, church, or civil. I think we have some teachings in Scripture on that. I'm not going to write it up there for now. Future life, is that important to us? Is that important to the Christian? I think it is very important to us. I'm just going to relate just a quick illustration of that. Um, it was actually from a different message that I had preached, but it was related of a, of a town in Vermont, a small town called Flagstaff, Vermont, that was, that was destined to be flooded. There was a dam supposed to be built, and it was, part, it was going to be in, in the lake. And so the town kept being lived in, but no one... <laughs> did any repairs. What was the future for that town? It was going to be destroyed. No one did any repairs. And the town kept falling apart until finally you know, it was abandoned to make way for the dam. But the, the, the illustration was given that without, where there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. <coughs> And Paul says that too. He says, if, if we have no hope of the future, he says, we are all men most miserable. What's the point? And I, th I think the, 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 the hope of a future life <coughs> is very important to us. Hope of future life. One other point I would have here is holy living. And I think it kind of goes along with what someone already shared that's meant to be lived out. The, the scripture, God expects us to live a holy life. 
And it's a foundational principle that we base our lives on. If, and I, I think it's important. It's an important aspect because there are sometimes teachings where it doesn't really matter what you do. You're saved. I think it does matter what we do. It is true that we sometimes fail. We're not perfect. But I believe that God intends for us to live a holy life. So these foundational principles are the basis for the decisions which we make in life. They provide us with the stability to, needed to withstand the storms and the winds of life. Sometimes there are Christians who have tried to eliminate some of the foundational stones in their lives, but doing so destroys the structural integrity of the foundation. You know, sometimes we can knock a stone out. It doesn't really seem like it makes that much difference on the structural integrity of the foundation. In fact, I've seen some foundations. I've wondered how they still stand. But it did. Those foundations are slowly crumbling. They're weakening as we knock out the stones. And I, I was kind of wishing I had some, some literal stones here and a sledgehammer and illustrative knocking some of those stones out. But I never thought they might make too much of a mess here. But, you know, just picture that in your life. That maybe there's something in these teachings, this foundation that God has provided us with, that we're kind of rebelling against. We'd rather not have that. Maybe it's the headship order. We'd like to get rid of that. We get rid of a stone. <coughs> Maybe you don't hardly see the effects of it right away. But as time goes on, what I've observed is most times when there's one thing that we don't want to have in that foundation, it keeps kind of crumbling. Pretty soon there's another stone that gets erased. And another one. And pretty soon another one. And just all at once the thing starts crumbling. And you know, we observe that in lives of, of family, of friends. That as they start knocking out some of those foundational principles, some of those stones, that eventually the stability of that foundation crumbles. I like what Peter says in 2 Peter 1, verse 3. He says, according to his, speaking of God, according as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. God has provided a foundation that enables us to go through life and build upon. It provides everything that we need for the decisions that we face in life, for the things that come our way, the hard things sometimes that shake us to the core. If we have a foundation that God has provided, we're building upon that, it stands. We can withstand those things. <clears throat> Many of you have heard of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It was a tower that was built in the 12th century and it's known for its almost four degree lean. In the 90s, 1990, in that time period, there was some remedial work done because the thing was starting to lean far enough that by now it would have fallen. But there was some remedial work done to, to stabilize that and bring it back a little bit. The problem with that tower is the foundation is only 10 feet deep. Now we think that's pretty pretty deep, but when you consider the height of the tower, it's only 10 feet deep, and what's underneath of it is not very good soil. As you think of that tower, I'd like to ask the question, is the foundation you're building on going to withstand the tests of time? Is it worth building on? God has provided the foundation that will give us all we need in order to govern, need to order and govern our lives. It is up to us whether we accept it. Our society around us is rapidly ab abandoning the moral and biblical tenets that has provided the stability and moorings that we have enjoyed 
for several hundred years. And we have. We've enjoyed the stability of a society. But that society is uh, rapidly abandoning those things that gave it stability. It's restrictive. It's archaic, they might say. And what they are trying to replace it with, or attempting to replace it with, is a foundation of humanism and human reasoning. And we're not the first society, and we're not the first civilization to do this. And as we look back at history, we see what happens to other civilizations. They build on a different foundation than what God has given. It crumbles, and it fails. And this one will as well. It will also fail. And so my encouragement is, build upon God's foundation. It will give us the stability we need in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. It really will. You know, we, can, we don't have to wring our hands at what's happening. But we can build upon what God has provided. And we can be that stable force in society around us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that gives us a foundation. We thank you for the work of the cross in Jesus who came to show us love, to show us redemption. Lord, you have provided the foundation. Sometimes there are things that we rebel against. Sometimes there are things that we would like to get rid of. But we recognize that as we do so, we weaken the integrity of our foundation. We don't have that liberty to get rid of the stones, the foundation that you have given us. Our choice is to accept that and obey it. May you bless the church here, help them to continue to building upon that foundation and to be that stable force in their community. May you guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.